Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us to celebrate World Toilet Day. My name is Megan. I'm the Events and Programs Manager at the Australian Global Citizen Office. I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which we're all meeting on this morning um, and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. A uh, very special welcome to all of our global citizens joining us from across Australia, our sector partners, government representatives, and we're delighted that a couple of the, uh, our fabulous board directors from the Global Citizen Australia Board could be here today, including our chair, Mary Wooldridge, Natasha Stockdespoyer, possibly a couple of others that might have snuck in in the last couple of moments as well. Um, a very big welcome to you all. Um, today's format is going to be fun. I think it's going to be a jam-packed hour. It's been a big year, not only for toilets, but also for toilet paper in 2020. And so looking forward to um, hearing more from our friends at WaterAid on that topic specifically. Uh, the format, bit of housekeeping. Um, I am going to hand over shortly to my colleague, Sarah, our Australian Director here at Global Citizen, who's going to talk a little bit about what will Toilet Day um, and Sustainable Development Goal number six means to us and our work at Global Citizen. Before we then hear from Rosie Ween, our CEO of WaterAid Australia. And then we're going to hear from two fantastic uh, partners of the Australian Government's Water for Women Fund. Um, they're going to bring to life some of the incredible stories and impact that, um, that this fund and the Australian Government's work has meant for people living in Vietnam and in Cambodia. So I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to that. We're going to then move to a brief panel discussion facilitated by my other colleague, Maddie, um, before we go into a little Q&A section where we'll answer some of your questions, which I would like to invite you all to pop in the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen at any point throughout the next 40 minutes or so of discussion, and we'll seek to get a couple of those answered. Um, before uh, Next thing I'd love to ask you all to introduce yourselves because we would love to say hello. Please, uh, in the chat tab, which you'll also find below, let us know your name and where you're joining from so we can say hello as well. We want to make sure this is a two-way conversation today. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way and pass over to um, my colleague, Sarah Meredith, our Australian Country Director of Global Citizen, to kick things off. Thank you all very much again for being here. Thank you, Megan, and hello, everyone. Um, we're delighted to once again have an event for World Toilet Day. It is a very important part of our annual calendar at Global Citizen. Um, as many of you know, uh, at Global Citizen, we campaign to see a world without extreme poverty. And the roadmap to ending extreme poverty are the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. 17 goals that have a list of KPIs and measurements. And if all the world's countries come together and, and, and corporates and philanthropists and invest in making sure we deliver on those targets, we could see a world without poverty in our lifetime. And, and one of those key goals is goal number six, water and sanitation. And for us at Global Citizen, we've campaigned on this for a very long time. Um, we've hosted festivals in Mumbai, India, focused solely on World Toilet Day and ending open defecation. And it's really a part of our DNA that we want to make this issue a priority of what we campaign on. Um, for the Australian Global Citizen team, we've been really proud to partner with WaterAid since 2016. Um, we kicked our partnership off with a bang when we partnered with Coldplay for their Australian tour. And we had um, hundreds of global citizens volunteer their time to get uh, attendees at the concerts to sign a petition to ask the Australian government to continue its investment and increase its investment in water and sanitation. And we're really proud that we continue to advocate on that to this day. Um, I'm delighted that we have Rosie Ween joining us, CEO of WaterAid. Rosie has an incredible career. She's been with WaterAid since its early days. Um, she's a passionate advocate. She sits on a number of boards, including the Australian Council for International Development, which many of you know will, is the representative agency of many development organisations here in Australia. So um, she's a great friend and mentor to me personally, and I'm delighted to have her. So um, Rosie, we'll kick it off to you to give the lowdown on the stats and, and the situation today. 
Sarah, thank you so much. What a pleasure it is to be joining you on World Toilet Day. And I'm joining you from Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations people that join us today. Um, so I haven't seen much in the chat box yet, so I can't wait to see who's on the line and um, what you're looking forward to talking about on World Toilet Day. And I really hope that I can share with you um, some of the important work that WaterAid is doing and to really talk about toilets. And I hope that I can take you deep into the world of a toilet champion uh, and I really hope that I can inspire you to become a toilet champion um, and really come out of this conversation with a passion for toilets and a recognition of how important they are for us to be making this world more just, more equitable and more resilient. Now, I'm really hoping that you can see me on your screen because I've got a few props to try and take you into the world of toilet champions. And I have to start at the beginning. Now, Sarah so kindly in her introduction spoke so positively about me. So I want you to know I don't usually talk trash and talk negatively, but I am going to introduce you to our public enemy number one. And that is, of course, a poo. Because poo, in particularly in low income and developing countries, is responsible for, it has within it millions, millions of viruses and bacteria, and is responsible for many preventable diarrheal diseases, for cholera and for dysentery. And as a toilet champions that we're all going to become, our mission is to stop those viruses and the transmission of those diseases from reaching children. Children such as Dei, I hope you can see him in the photo here, this beautiful baby that I had the privilege of naming uh, when he was born some 20 odd years ago. It's children like Dei that are particularly vulnerable to those diarrheal diseases caused by the poo. And we know that all children are impacted by those diarrheal diseases. Today and every day, a child will die every two minutes from diarrheal diseases. We also know that children such as Asa, Dei's cousin there in the photo, being a girl, she will be further impacted. She runs the risk when she has to defecate or we in the rice paddies, the ocean uh, or around her house of being assaulted. We know that girls, when they go to school and there aren't toilets for them to manage their periods, they miss a lot of school or even drop out. And this is why it's so important that we focus on addressing this crisis. And when I think about those impacts and actually how simple the solutions are, I feel really frustrated and I feel really angry. And these emotions are ones that I share with other toilet champions around the world. For example, uh, when I was in Cambodia, I went north to a province called Kampung Chenang. And I met this amazing group of leaders, district and commune champions that were coming together with WaterAid and our partners to work on a leadership challenge. One of the leaders that I met was a woman called Mrs. Po. It was a steaming hot day, but she still had her pink jumper on. And as we spoke quietly in the meeting room, she talked to me about her journey becoming a toilet champion. And with such quiet pride, she spoke about at the beginning how hard it was because no one wanted to talk about the issues of toilets. But she was committed to making sure everyone in her commune had a toilet because she knew the girls in her community were being assaulted when they had to go to the toilet in the rice fields. So toilets are absolutely our number one barrier preventing the transmission of diseases and for containing our public enemy number one. But we know, of course, that it's important for people to have access to clean water and hand washing. And with this, with these three important barriers, we stop the transmission of those diseases reaching uh, children like Debbie. 
But as Sarah said, we've got the SDGs and that goal of universal access for everyone everywhere to have access to safe water, decent toilets and good hygiene. But our progress is disgracefully slow. There are still 2 billion people in the world that don't have access to a decent toilet. And we know within those large numbers, there are some that are disproportionately represented, such as people with disabilities. So if that sanitation crisis isn't enough for us to think we need to take action, let me overlay the climate crisis on top of that. We know that with severe weather events such as flooding, sanitation infrastructure is at risk. We know that access to clean water is a challenge and then, of course, people can't wash their hands. So we know that to be more climate resilient, we need to make sure we have the sanitation infrastructure that can withstand those climate events. We know that we, there are solutions. We can ensure that there are early warning systems so that households and sanitation workers can be told if a flood is coming. And absolutely a key priority to addressing this crisis is investing in sanitation workers so that they have decent conditions. Let me take you for a moment into the shoes of a sanitation worker. I'm going to call this sanitation worker Raza. It's not his true name because he wouldn't want his name to be shared or his identity to be shared. Because Raza leaves his house every morning with a lie on his lips. He doesn't even tell his family the job that he does. Raza has one of the most dangerous jobs in India, being a sanitation worker. He turns up to work in his uniform, which is basically just a pair of shorts. He'll take a big drag on a cigarette to try and cover the smell of the sewer that he's about to enter, because his job is usually to unblock, for example, a sewer or to clean out a septic tank. He takes the drag of cigarette and he looks down, he's got no shoes on, and he looks down at the manhole and he'll lift it, as I understand, to see if bugs will come out or not. If they do come out, he takes that as a signal that it's safe for him to enter. If they don't, it's a signal that there are deadly gases inside. But as I said, this is one of the deadliest jobs in India. Since records began in 2017, a sanitation worker has died in India every five days. So I'm asking us on World Toilet Day to stand as toilet champions, to stand and support and invest in sanitation workers to call on governments to take action on the climate crisis and also the sanitation crisis and to ensure that we can absolutely make sure that there are climate adaptation plans that focus on sanitation services so we can protect children like Dei and Asa, and we can absolutely make sure that by 2030, we achieve that goal of universal access to water, sanitation and hygiene. So I really hope that around the world that we are all coming together on World Toilet Day as absolutely toilet champions across the global citizen family. So thank you very much. And I hand back over to you now to the global citizen team. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rosie. I um, am now delighted to be able to introduce uh, two incredible next speakers joining us from Cambodia and from California this morning, who are here to put faces and names to some of the incredible work that is being undertaken by Water for Women in our region. Water for Women is the Australian government's flagship WASH program and is being delivered as part of Australia's aid program, investing over 110 million across five years from 2018 to 2018. 2022. Water for Women is supporting improved health, gender equality and well-being in Asia um, and Pacific communities through socially inclusive and sustainable water sanitation and hygiene projects. Uh, gender equality and, and social inclusion are central to Water for Women, actively involving 
people within all communities, whether that be women, men, marginalised groups, people living with disabilities, uh, ensures more equitable and inclusive progress, which uh, leads to more effective and sustainable outcomes in water, sanitation and hygiene. Tyler and Lynn's organisations are two of nine civil, so civil society organisation partners uh, of Water for Women, delivering 18 projects across 15 countries. We will hear from Tyler and Lynn now, but uh, before, um, and then I will bring, bring Rosie back together for a short panel discussion uh, at the end. Um, and don't forget everyone, you're welcome to submit some questions in the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll come back to those uh, right before we finish. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker though, we do have a short video that uh, will help share this story. I'll get Megan to press play. Thank you. change. With support from the Australian Government, Water for Women is strengthening our regional response to COVID-19. Our partners have established footprints and strong networks across Asia and the Pacific. A focus on partnerships for recovery has enabled us to move quickly and work collaboratively to support communities to prepare for, respond to and recover from COVID-19. The needs of vulnerable people is central to our work to ensure we leave no one behind. WASH has a profound and lasting impact on communities. We are working together to meet this global challenge now and to build healthy, inclusive and resilient societies across the region into the future. Water for Women is the Australian Government's flagship WASH program. A water and wash response is a COVID-19 response. Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. Okay, let's get into it. I am delighted to introduce Tyler Kazol, the Innovation and Partnerships Manager at IDE Global based in Cambodia. Tyler, over to you. Thanks, Maddie, and thank you, Global Citizen and WaterAid, for hosting the event. Uh, happy World Toilet Day, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is Tyler Kazol. I work for IDE Cambodia's WASH program. Uh, if you haven't heard about who IDE is and what we do, we're a market-based development organization. We operate in 14 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We're based out of the USA, but we have offices in Canada and the UK as well. We do work in water, sanitation, hygiene, agriculture, food security, access to finance, and climate resilience. So we started in Cambodia in 1994. Our WASH program started in 2009, and our WASH program is called the Sanitation Marketing Scale-Up Program. So when we started our program in 2009, sanitation coverage nationally was around 23%, and we needed to figure out why. We deploy a method called human centered design. And what that means in, in short is that we talked to a whole lot of people and tried to figure out why people were not investing in toilets on their own. We, you know, we talked about behaviors, motivations, challenges, blocks, uh, ways that we could really inspire people and enable people to access sanitation. Well, we converted those insights into developing a product called the Easy Latrine. The Easy Latrine, it's a low cost toilet that even poor people can buy. And to date, we've sold over 350,000 of these toilets in rural Cambodia, which equates to around a million and a half people or 10% of the national Cambodian population. So in order to really generate demand for these products and really change behavior, we use sales. We have a ground-based professional sales team who are our behavior change agents. They use a method that we call human-centered sales. We focus on the needs of the customer. We have a consultative process and we really try to bring their issues in their life into the conversation in the forefront. We have messages of dignity and pride, aspirations and goals. We don't really focus on the negatives. 
we we don't, we don't play this shame and guilt game that uh, that in some parts of the watch sector are uh, are used. So typically, after we sell a product, the next step is we need this to be delivered to these rural households. We do that through partnering with local businesses. We have a network of around 70 local businesses around the country. And these are often small construction businesses, concrete producers, people who are we, able, we are able to, to train on how to build our products. So since the Easy Latrine, we've developed four other products or five other products, four latrine shelter products and an alternating dual pit product that enables households to manage their, their waste sustainably into the future. And after we're able to train these businesses to manufacture these products, they work to then deliver, install, and provide customer service for the product to the customer. In addition, we provide them with a lot of support to maintain their business in their own right, to be viable with or without IDE. And we provide active coaching throughout this entire process to make sure that they're, uh, they're running their own businesses. So in the past couple of years in the Water for Women Fund, one of the new ways that we've been offering business support is through a partnership with an organization called She Investments. She does, in short, empowerment and capacity building for female entrepreneurs. So we started a pilot program in Simrit province in Northern Cambodia, where we were able to recruit 10 of our female entrepreneurs, female latrine business owners to get together for a business incubator program. For one, uh, for one weekend every month, for six months, these women got together and they learned about core business basics. They talked about negotiations, uh, marketing, recruitment, financial management, et cetera. But also these lessons were combined with a method called peer, peer mentoring, really, which enabled women to collectively solve problems and discuss their business challenges, but also their household challenges. The line is really blurred in most contexts. And Having a safe space for these women to discuss these issues enabled a really empathetic problem solving process that helped a lot of these women get to the goals that they set out in the beginning. So we were incredibly impressed with the results of this pilot and, and how the women responded and how they changed throughout it. And we decided to scale that entire curriculum to our entire trained business uh, network. And that's what we're doing right now. So one of the women who helped us make that decision it's a woman named Ramdul Savan. Uh, so Ramdul, uh, she had been operating a beauty salon in nearby Banti Manche province. Her husband, Chin Bun Siang, who you can see on the right there, was one of our long-term IDE latrine business owners. And they had a goal. They wanted to own a hardware store to add to the impact of their latrine business. They wanted to create new customers and be able to create feedback loops where they would really play off one another. They could deepen their market, but also diversify with new products. And so Bond would be able to live closer to her husband and they could work as a team. So when, uh, when the She Investments pilot began, they had this plan to build this hardware store, but it was stalled. They had a plot of land, but there was nothing on it and they didn't really know how they would get to that point. The first day of the She Investments incubator, the the key point is that the the partners of the business get together and create a shared vision for their business. So Van and Boon Siang said, "We want to have a foundation laid in six months for our business." They had a foundation built in four months, and within a year, they had built their hardware store. Uh, I visited Sovan about six months ago in June, and she was glowing. She couldn't. Couldn't stop talking about the specific skills and techniques that she's now applying every day. Negotiation is something that she was afraid of. She wasn't sure if she was being ripped off by suppliers and felt that it was a really a scary process. Now she has tactics and ways to, to make sure that she's knowing she's getting the right price. And she said this literally as a concrete supplier came into the building while I was there and she politely but assertively asked him to please wait while she finished her conversation. So she said this and Meanwhile, uh, Poon seeing her husband is, is next to her, nodding and smiling the entire time. We get to the point of talking about how it's affected their family. And one of the key pieces of training in the She Investments Workshop is how you can increase the decision-making power of the women in the enterprise through in important tactics like separating your household finances from your business finances and how paying yourself a salary is another really important way to do that and that you can pay yourself a salary. So 
when Sivan's talking about this, Boon Sang is agreeing, and she explains to us that she actually set not only her salary, but her husband's salary for his respective business. Uh, he agreed. She said as soon as she explained the logic to it, it wasn't a hard decision to make, and that every decision that she makes in the business is as valid as her husband's. And this for us is sustainability. At IDE, we know that we're not going to be here forever, and we don't want to be. Uh, the people who are going to take this sanitation market forward are the entrepreneurs who are willing to invest in themselves, invest in their future, but also make space to continue to deliver these wash products to communities. So uh, that's that's one of the things that keep me going uh, generally every day. I, I think I've gone a bit over time. Uh, that's uh, that's our story. Uh, you've caught me gushing about uh, a couple of our favorite latrine business owners. Not at all. That's an incredible story, Tyler. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm hoping we can come back um, and discuss a little bit more because I know I've got questions myself. But for now, um, I'm going to jump over and I'm delighted to introduce Lynn Foden, the CEO of Thrive Networks, uh, an organization pioneering evidence based wash programs in underserved communities in Southeast Asia. Uh, welcome, Lynn. We're excited to hear your story. No, this is uh, this is awesome. And, um, and I'm also grateful to be starting World Toilet Day here in the US on the 18th. So I was telling these guys that I get a really, I get a longer time to have World Toilet Day. So uh, Thrive Networks uh, focuses our work in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And we've been in Vietnam for over 32 years. And uh, our work is, uh, is focused around uh, output-based assistance or results-based work. Uh, and so um, what I wanted to do was just tee up very quickly, because you'll only get a few uh, seconds of a video that we produced, um, which really captures the journey of Yen and her aunt, uh, Bo, and the challenges that they're faced as a disabled elderly woman, and how it really impacts the whole family, the fact that they don't have access to a toilet. So we'll just see a little snippet of it. It's a little taster for you, and the link for the full video you'll get later on. But let's, uh, let's just take a quick look to get started. Ngày mấy năm trước thì mẹ tôi qua đời thì bỏ gì tôi thì để bị tàn tật thì sáng với tôi à, bởi vì tôi thì bà nuôi tôi từ nhỏ đến lớn nuôi tôi ăn học à, cho nên đó là cũng là bổn phận của tôi chăm cho gì à, nhưng mà mỗi tháng thì có tiền trợ cấp của người khuyết tật rồi à, con tôi thì nó cũng mỗi tháng nó cũng cho được chút đỉnh nhưng mà việc chăm sóc gì thì nó cũng không có là dễ dàng đó ờ à, đúng rồi đó à. rồi ngồi xuống ngồi xuống giường bình thường đi So when you have a chance to watch the rest of the video, you'll be able to see the entire story of how in working in partnership through the Vietnam Women's Union, families like Yen and Bo are now able to access a hygienic latrine and the way that has transformed the whole family. Because if you have a disabled member in your family, you don't realize the additional challenges and burdens. It's not just on the disabled individual, but it's the whole family and the community that's impacted by the lack of something as basic as having a toilet that's accessible. In our work with uh, Water for Women, we work through five big pillars. So, because these are the principles within which we believe that sustainable change is going to happen. The first one is working in partnership with the government, because we believe that in order for sustainable change, we need the policies of the government to change. And we also need to mobilize their resources and their financial contributions. And so one of our pillars is working with the government and trying to help to transform the way that they're doing business and the attention that they're paying to the issues. 
as others have talked about, the second pillar is around partnership because no one individual or group can do it alone. And so it's how we're bringing people together in partnership to create the change. The third pillar is creating that infrastructure because unless people actually have the access to a toilet or water, just as Rosie had described, we need to have that infrastructure in place. So the third pillar is around ensuring that there is the infrastructure that's there. The fourth pillar is around capacity building because we want to be able to have all of the individuals and organizations have the knowledge, the skills, the confidence to be able to go forward and create this change in the community for the long term. And then the fifth pillar is around that evidence base. It's around the learning and documenting so that we're able to share this knowledge. So those are the five overarching pillars that we use in our programming. With Water for Women and the funding that we've received from the Australian government, over 200,000 households in Vietnam now have the infrastructure. They now have the toilets they're able, to, um, they're able to, to use for their families. A million and a half people now have the education and the training. But I think importantly, it's the 6,000 women in the Vietnam Women's Union who have been mobilized and who now also have that skills and training so that they are change makers in their families, in their communities, but also at the provincial and the national levels, because we also wanna have a seat at the table when national governments are making decisions. And we've been working in the women's union so that they can sit at that table. They've got the knowledge, they've got, just as, um, just as Tyler was talking about those negotiation skills, that's what we're working on with the union so that they have a voice at the big table because that's where the decisions are being made and so that's one of the things that we want to ensure we think of vietnam as a country as a middle income country but yet in remote communities and disadvantaged communities half of the population still does not have access to a hygienic latrine so there is a lot of work that needs to be done for us to be able to really say that we are leaving no one behind. So as we work together on this, creating change at all levels, at the national level so that systems change, at provincial levels, community levels, and then within each household so that women, disabled, children, everybody has a voice, has the resources, has the knowledge and skills to make these changes happen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lynn. That's wonderful. I I want to welcome um, Rosie and Tyler back to our uh, conversation alongside Lynn as we have a bit of a, a, a discussion. I've got a couple of questions here to kick us off. Um, so everyone, please feel free to jump in. I might put this to Rosie to begin with, though. Uh, we, we know that innovation within the water and sanitation sector and improvements in affordable wash uh, uh, technology can have huge impacts on communities. Uh, what new research and innovation have you seen in the sector recently? Um, thanks, Maddie. And so great hearing the fantastic work of Thrive and IDE and really bringing to life the work of the Water for Women um, program across the world. I mean, the, when I think about innovation, I'm thinking about change, you know, adaptation that bring change that has an impact. Yeah. And one of the things, uh, as we were hearing from in there, particularly at the end, the importance of the role of government. And one of the fantastic innovation that I've seen is the use of smartphones to help get information into the hands of people in government that are making decisions. So an example of that is this uh, tool called mWater that was developed by a maternal and child health nurse and someone who left NASA. And they were looking at the WASH challenge and thinking about how can we make sure that decision makers know who does have access to water and who doesn't and how can they um, allocate resources. And it's this really simple tool that community members um, 
can load information about the um, services that they have in their community. And it means that for, in some places, it's the first time ever that decision makers have in their hand the information of what are the services in their community like and where do they need to be planning for future investments or really importantly, going back and maintaining uh, infrastructure that there might be uh, an issue with. And so for me, that's been one of the really exciting uh, innovations. Um, but also I wanna highlight what I love from Tyler and Lynn was the focus on simple adaptations and innovations to make infrastructure accessible and to make, um, to make sure that the people who are using the technology are part of the conversation around the design because I think that's been absolutely essential to ensuring that uh, those services get to those uh, that need it most. Wonderful. I, I mean, hearing all of you speak, it, it's so clear that while there is still a lot to do um, to ensure that we have clean water and adequate sanitation for all, there is just so much good that is already happening in this sector and we've made so much progress. I, I would love to hear from all of you um, whether there was one moment, one key moment in your work to date that, that really just showed hope for the future and, and hope for the people living in it. Uh, Lynn, perhaps we could hear from you first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that that's great because uh, particularly as we're going through such challenging times right now, we do have to hang on to those to those moments. Um, and I think for me, it was uh, in March when I was uh, when I was in Vietnam. I got there and was able to uh, to, to visit just before things were. We're sort of shutting down, um, and I was meeting with um, with the women's union, with the Vietnam Women's Union, and um, and I was meeting with Mrs. Wynn, who uh, is the vice secretary, and we were having a conversation, and I was asking her, you know, about what are some of the things that um, you know that that she's seen and that she's proud of, um, and one of the things was that uh, in a um, in one of the government committee meetings, as they were trying to look at the allocations for um, for funding uh, within the government. And she said that it was the first time that she felt comfortable at a table with mostly men for her to be able to, you know, to sit up and say, you know, and she had the facts, she had the information, and she was able to talk about the fact that families and communities and at the local level that there were resources, that there were funds that were being allocated. And she sort of shamed them at the, at the national level saying, look, this is all happening on the ground. And we really have to lead by example that it's great to have the ground up change, but we also need to be supporting it at the national level. And and it was funny because she was, you know, even as she was saying it, she was sort of, you know, like she was like, and I was a little bit shy about it. And I didn't really want to. And I was like, what? And then, you know, then she said, you know, look, now I know and I know that I have the right and that I have the responsibility because we have our members who are working at the ground, but somebody has to be able to speak for them at the table. And she was like, and this was the first time that I felt like I could be the person that was doing that. Um, and so for me, that was one of that transformational moments when you see somebody who now has this new confidence and was able to, you know, to create some change where she never thought that she was able to do that before. So that was, I, I can still sort of see her face and it, yeah, it was great. It was great. Oh, I love that. And you can see how it's affected you just by the way that you talk about it. It's so heartening. That's beautiful. Uh, Tyler, I would love to hear um, whether you have a similar story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, just something fresh on my mind. Last week I was in Prevang province in southern Cambodia and I was talking with a lot of our business owners. Uh, you know, Ed, in our program, we, we say that our customers are our lifeblood, but our business owners are our heart and soul. Like these are the people who are really going to contain or to continue our work. And I was talking with a guy named Sam Un. He asked me to call him Simon because uh, he knows I can't pronounce his name correctly. And this guy, he used to he used to work for an NGO. He used to be someone who was in his community trying to make an impact through going door to door and doing different kind of behavior change presentations. And 
he decided about four years ago that the impact that he wanted to make in his community was going to be more sustainable through a business. And he decided that by developing a, well, he's one of our latrine business owners, uh, by developing this business, he's going to be able to continue on and he's going to be able to reach a lot more people and in a more substantive way, but while also doing well for him and his family. And so I think these are the people who are going to really continue to change the world. Like, these are the people who are going to continue to be the motivation and the energy behind any kind of wash transformation in our, in our, in our working areas. Uh, the grit and the, the persistence and just the energy that these people have is, is inspiring. He's one of many uh, who I've talked to who have given me the same feeling. Incredible. Thank you, Tyler. Rosie, did you want to add something? I would love to add something. Uh, I thought you might. <laughs> and I... You know, as much as I see this crisis and it makes, makes me feel so frustrated that we're making such slow progress to SDG 6, um, I think a, a, a story perhaps of a country level that gives me a sense of incredible hope is to look to India, where we see the role of political will and the Swachh Bharat campaign that uh, Modi brought in a number of years ago. So Swachh Bharat is talking about having uh, open defecation free India and clean India. And it was all framed around this idea of a national hero, the national identity around Gandhi. When you look at the emblem for, for the Swachh Bharat campaign, it's Modi's glasses. And you see that everywhere. And what we have seen in India is an incredible lift out of open defecation, where they have declared themselves now open defecation free, where it used to be the largest number of people in the world defecating in the open. And that to me gives me a sense of hope. We know that we can achieve this change uh, by 2030 if we take the path of countries like South Korea, Thailand and Singapore that did it in a generation, but we're not going to achieve it if we keep going at the pace we are. So we need to look to countries like India that have that political leadership that opens up all of those opportunities for the private sector that Tyler's talking about, for unlocking the potential of, we, uh, for, of women that Lynn's talking about. We need all of those things happening. And when I look at the story in India, uh, that does give me great hope. And, and for people listening, um, our wonderful attendees that, like me, have been inspired by this conversation and, and want to go out now and, and take action and speed up progress to achieving these goals, uh, what um, each of you would be one thing that you would say to um, just to global citizens, to people attending, um, everyday people that they can do to, um, to go out and make a difference on this topic? Well, I think um, I think one thing is um, is exactly what they're doing, what you all are doing today. It's it's being informed. It's being part of this conversation. It's creating networks of uh, of advocates, of creating these networks of of toilet champions, because it is something that if we're going to solve these issues. We have to do it in partnership. We have to do it in collaboration. We've got to create this movement. And you know, the fact that there is a World Toilet Day, but yet, you know, everybody who's on this knows that there's a World Toilet Day. But how many, like you talk to your friends, you talk to your relatives, and everybody's kind of like, huh? And so, you know, what you're doing today, coming together, listening, expanding your networks, because it really is creating that, that global movement and letting others know about it, keeping yourselves informed and understanding as well some of the intricacies of these interrelated topics. Because on the one hand, it is simple. It's a latrine, it's water. On the other hand, it is complex. As Rosie was indicating, you know, when we look at climate change, when we look at COVID-19, when we look at these interrelated issues, it can become complicated and daunting. But yet, the more we learn about it, the more we talk to each other, the more we find ways of being able to collaborate. Even thinking about like how I can, how my organization, can collaborate more with IDE and with WaterAid and with others who are involved in the sector so that we're all coming together and because it's that unified front that's gonna create the change. Uh, 
I, yeah, I would, I would say just to like everybody, uh, whether or not you work for an NGO or whether or not you, you know, you're learning about sanitation for the first time. I think the one thing that I would ask you to do is go thank your toilet and then wash your hands. <laughs> uh, I think we, we take sanitation for granted a lot of the time. And I think it's one of the reasons that people forget about sanitation is one of the key parts of water and sanitation. So I think the more that people remember the toilets and hand washing facilities, these things that we use every day, if you don't have them, what would your life be like? And the more attention we can give to that, I think the more that it's going to become a priority and the more that a unified front that Lynn's talking about can actually happen. So I would say it really starts with the public and people actually feeling for this issue. Nice one, Tyler. I'm going to build on that and not only thank your toilet, but think that you should thank sanitation workers and the people that work behind the scenes to make it happen. Um, because all of us, no matter where we are, are supported by that infrastructure and those people that we so often don't see or recognize. They are absolutely frontline workers, people like Raza and so many others. If you're in Australia or Lynn in California, you could buy um, Who Gives a Crap toilet paper, um, which is a fantastic online subscription. You never have to do COVID panic buying of toilet paper again. You can get your online subscription of toilet paper from Who Gives a Crap, uh, and they donate 50% of their profits uh, to providing decent toilets around the world. And that's a great example, again, of the working together with the private sector and what we can do. And they're actually having a toilet party um, after this. So if you want to keep the World Toilet Day celebrations, you can go from this to a toilet party on Facebook with Who Gives a Crap. I love that. Who would have thought 2020 would be the year that toilet paper has just been so thrust in front of everybody. So you're doing a good thing and also saving yourself from those toilet paper um, rushes that we all witnessed earlier this year. I want to turn now to a couple of questions that I can see in our chat function. One of them's caught my eye because it's a topic um, and an issue that we focus heavily on here at Global Citizen, and that's the topic of menstrual hygiene. Um, I can see a question that says, how do we tackle access to menstrual hygiene products and taboos, particularly in remote parts of the Pacific and PNG? Happy for anybody to jump in and, and give some some of their thoughts on this. I'm happy to kick us off. Um, thanks for that really important question. And again, that's a good topic that we don't talk about uh, enough. And the question that Sarah asks around uh, taboos, I might start there and then talk about products because it it's something that uh, WaterAid and our partners in Papua New Guinea have been working on for a number of years to first of all, understand um, how to have conversations around periods and to take away some of those taboos to recognize that there's no shame in having your period. It's something to be celebrated. Uh, and there's been some fantastic work by our partners in terms of radio programs and uh, programs that are done in schools uh, in partnership with an organisation called Mari Stokes uh, to look at um, how we can improve uh, menstrual health education, sex education programs in schools, because that is so important. Unfortunately, so many girls in Papua New Guinea who we've talked to don't even know what's happening to them when they get their period because there's, because of colonisation and development there's been a loss of the traditional passing on of knowledge and understanding around uh, periods. So it's really important to address those um, taboos and to take away the shame, but also to make sure that there are products. So the research that we've done with the Burnett Institute has showed that there's really poor quality products uh, that uh, and very expensive ones across the Pacific. So we're really looking at how we can support uh, women's is to get uh, better quality products across the Pacific. There's a fantastic group uh, in the Solomon Islands, a group of Solomon Island women set up as a social enterprise selling reusable pads along with information uh, that gets out to communities um, called Calico Stay Free. You can find them on social media. 
Uh, and so we're doing a lot to work with women's organizations across the Pacific to break the taboos, but also to look at how we can get those supply chains of products uh, to women and girls and um, anyone in those rates. Well, I can't speak specifically to uh, the PA. Uh, but in um, in some of the work that we're doing around menstrual hygiene management, um, in addition to uh, you know some of the the products, really looking at how we can get men and boys to be allies and change makers in this. So as we're doing what we call the the triggering or uh, some of the education campaigns, the mobilization campaigns. Uh, for families to agree to upgrade and create a hygienic latrine, um, part of those conversations are around menstrual hygiene management, and it is around getting the husbands and the sons as part of those conversations. Uh, because oftentimes, and this was something that was honestly difficult for our staff to do, and so it, it really actually took training with our own staff, because whether they were female staff or ma male staff, both of them were very, very uneasy. And so it was first the transformation inside our organization to make sure that our staff was really comfortable in having these conversations and then being able to go out and working with our partners on the ground uh, so that they could also have this have these conversations. And so it was kind of that 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 ripple effect from from internal change in the organization to then having them have those conversations and really having that focus on on men and boys as part of the um, the change and breaking down some of the taboos. Yeah, just to jump in quickly from the Cambodia context as well. I, I really don't know uh, Pacific uh, Pacific context as far as this is concerned, but one of the issues that that we've seen, uh, whether it's in, I, I lived in Vietnam before this, and I've seen this in both Cambodia and Vietnam. That sometimes there are not actually words that are comfortably used in the language to describe these things. Uh, so much of it is is just shifted around because of the uncomfortability of the conversation. And sometimes it's just because of the technicality of the language. Even the concept gender in Cambodia, there is not a literal translation for the word gender. So imagine doing a gender mainstreaming tr like training without actually having the word gender as something that's equally defined for the participants. It's a challenge. I mean, there's, there's like there's technical challenges with having these conversations. And so I would say like one of the other key pieces of this is really laying the groundwork to to find a way to better communicate these messages and break the taboo by talking about it in a way that people can understand what they're actually talking about. That's fascinating. I would never have realized or even really thought um, of the the language barriers that can come. Um, when discussing these topics. And it's a perfect segue. I know we're sort of running a little bit out of time. We're nearing the end of our hour. But I do want to ask a question that I can see in the chat that I think is really um, interesting and builds off what we've just spoken about. And that is what are the biggest barriers um, that you face when implementing and running your respective um, programs and projects? Tyler, perhaps you um, can kick us off. Sure. Yeah, I'll take this and I'll, I'll try to combine it with uh, Tegan's question. I, I think they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, for us, our biggest problem since we started is uh, is that there's still a belief from some development implementers, from some big multilaterals, that you can drop off a toilet, that you can <laughs> fully subsidize a product and put it into a community, and that's it. And that your job is totally finished after that. It's it's not the way it works. If you do that, you're distorting a market in many cases. Who is going to buy or sell a toilet after someone has has just gotten one for free? You're not changing behavior. You have no evidence of that. If you're selling a product, you're actually ensuring that someone has demand for it. So you're ensuring that the product is actually fitting needs rather than just being placed there so you can check a box. Uh, the way that we've gotten through that is time. I mean, it's advocacy, persistence. We've we've pushed this message since we started that. You can have a market that does good. And there have been a lot of people who have not believed it for years. I think one of the ways that we've been able to change that narrative has, has also been results. You know, we're leveraging finance from private households. We're not the ones buying all of these toilets. So we can actually reach a higher level of scale as well. So we've been diligent about keeping our evidence, uh, keeping our evidence public and, and really making sure we're, we're tracking all this stuff so that we can put this time and persistence and advocacy to good use using real results. 
that's how I would say we've gotten through it. And we're certainly not over the hurdle. There are still definitely places where we have huge challenges trying to sell toilets because of this problem. I would just quickly say for us, um, some of it is, um, is is structural issues because you've got so many different players who have their own niches, whether it's the Minister of Health, the Minister of Education, Natural Resources, Agriculture. Uh, and so, you know, trying to get these groups to together on a common agenda uh, has been uh, has been quite uh, quite a challenge. So it's the fragmentation across the players who are there uh, and trying to get people to talk together, work together, and to see this as uh, if we can if we we can we can grow the pie. It's not um, it's not having smaller slices, but it's actually being able to grow the pie so everybody gets a little bit more. I think for me straight away when you asked that question, I was perhaps thinking very immediate and for me it's the COVID challenge at the moment and what a big challenge it is in so many of the countries where we work um, and the focus that's going on that and perhaps then uh, lessening of the focus on some of these basic rights and recognising the key role that particularly uh, hand washing and safe water play in prevention of COVID and that message we're just not seeing uh, necessarily recognised in governments around the world. And that to me is one of the biggest challenges as well as keeping all of our partners and, and people safe during these times. And uh, I've never been prouder of the work of our teams and our partners and doing things like this, connecting with the amazing team at Global Citizen with ID and Thrive, you know, in these tough times, it really does remind us of the power of, of coming together uh, to make this change happen while we're celebrating World Toilet Day. We've got a big way to go, but with collaboration, we can definitely get through these challenges that we face. Absolutely. So true. I, um, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today um, and all of our wonderful uh, attendees. I'm going to quickly throw to Megan, who is going to uh, just wrap up and give some final remarks, but thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Maddie, and thank you so much to, once again to our fabulous speakers, um, Sarah, Rosie, Lynn and Tyler for taking the time to celebrate World Toilet Day with us um, today and sharing the stories of the wonderful people and communities that you work with. We're so grateful. Thank you so much, Global Citizens and friends and supporters, um, representatives of our partners um, here today, WaterAid, Women, Water for Women, Thrive Networks and IDE Global. Um, as always at Global Citizen, we love to finish with a call to action. Um, and that is, and we and at Global Citizen, we always talk about your voice being the most powerful tool that you have to help create change um, in the world around us. You can do that by hopping onto our website, globalcitizen.org, learning more about water and sanitation and all the other issues that we campaign on. Uh, read the content that is generated by journalists, including Maddie and others around on the world on this topic and take action. What we call for here in Australia is the Australian government to uh, continue to ensure that fabulous programs such as Water for Women are fully funded so they have the resources they need to make sure we achieve our goal of uh, everyone having everyone everywhere having access to a toilet. Before I go, I wanted to uh, mention very quickly to you um, that oh sorry uh, my powerpoint's got a mind of its own uh just this week you might have seen we launched the global citizen prize which is um an annual award show global citizen puts together to honor change makers doing incredible things around the world you can vote on one of those award categories the cisco youth leadership awards and you can uh do, by doing so, go into the draw to um, win a ticket to the Global Citizen Prize broadcast show Watch Party, which is hosted by John Legend. That's also on our website. I'll send an email with um, the link to that and the action, the full Thrive video that Lynn played a little snippet of um, as well. Um, 
I'll leave you all there. Thank you very much. This is our final grassroots event for 2020, and we look forward to coming back even bigger and better in 2021. Wishing you all a wonderful uh, remainder of your World Toilet Day. Thank you all and take care.